Good morning. Welcome to Cedar, Cedar Creek this morning. Good to see you all here. Uh, I think I misspoke last Sunday. I, I think I said last Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent. Today is. And I, I, was, I was listening to a, a, an Advent devotional this morning and talked about Advent means arrival or expected, coming. And uh, talking about the Gospels that recorded Jesus' coming. And two of them start with a genealogy, talking about Jesus' ancestors and think, what in the world? We made the point that uh, it didn't start out once upon a time. That's how fairy tales start. This isn't a fairy tale, it's history. Jesus came to earth once and will come again. And that's what we celebrate, that's what we look forward to. That's what, we're, what Advent is all about, looking forward. So one of the things you see up here, a happy-looking couple there ringing bells at uh, Walmart, just to let you know we accomplished that yesterday. All day long there was somebody from, from Cedar Creek ringing bells, and uh, Cole and Rachel were there bright and early. I think the first one's 8, eight to 9 o'clock, and uh, it was uh, a great time to serve in the community that way. So uh, thanks for sending that picture. It wasn't, it wasn't Cole and Rachel sent their picture. It's not somebody else. Anyway. All right. Uh, if you're new here, visiting, welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. Uh, if you could do us a favor, there's a green card in the seat back in front of you. If you could take that out and fill it out. And uh, there's a green box in the back by the center doors there. You could drop it in. We'd appreciate that very much. Uh, uh, Cedar Creek Youth Group is today. Middle school, high schoolers at uh, 1130 to 1230. So uh, if you fit that description, stick around. Uh, Saturday, the 9th, the uh, women's gathering, Christmas gathering. If, uh, if at all possible, ladies, be there. It'll be a, a good time of fellowship, just gathering together to spend some time together in the Christmas season, enjoying each other's company, some food, uh, would ask if you are able to sign up and let us let the planners know you're coming. That helps. But if you don't sign up or if your neighbor says at the last minute, hey, I can come too, bring them. So um, come next uh, Saturday at noon. Uh, the Iwana gift store uh, collection of things for the gift store. We talked about that before, but uh, gathering, we're, we're taking donations of... Uh, uh, gifts that the kids can pick out for moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas. And uh, if you have any questions, I think there's a suggested list out on the table there for the kinds of things they're looking for. And um, check that out. Christmas is on Monday this year. So that means Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. And so what we will be having our Christmas Eve service but not a Christmas Eve morning service. The 24th, we will not have a Sunday morning service. So we'll have the uh, 4 uh, p.m. candlelight service uh, as per usual on Christmas Eve. So, And uh, the Fusion Midwest Conference, December 27th to 29th. Uh, some details are in the uh, bulletin. You can uh, check that out online as well and uh, consider that. Now today, uh, you, we expected to have uh, uh, Mark Bowen. He spoke last Sunday, and he was going to come back and speak again this morning from Psalm 84. And uh, they had a, a, a sad week in their family. Uh, Mark and Judy's daughter uh, delivered a premature baby, and then the day baby did not survive. And so family's grieving. And Mark thought it best he not come today, but be with his family uh, as they uh, experience that. So we'll just take a minute, we'll pray for them, and then I'll invite Mike up. Father, we just do want to uh, bring Mark, Judy, and their family to you and ask for your comfort. You, you said you are near to the brokenhearted, and, and this is a sad time and, and for them, and I pray that you'd come alongside them that you would be alongside them and they would uh, be well aware of that. And thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness always. In your name, Jesus, amen. So in, in Mark's place, we are blessed to have Mike Langlois. He's a longtime pastor at the uh, hometown church in Lakeville. 
and he is going to share with us a, a message this morning. So come on up here, Mike. All right. Thanks, Mark. Can you grab that, move that mic? Thank you. All right. I'm going to move this too because I'm going to be, I would like to move around just a little. I don't want to knock anything down. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. Um, I, I feel bad for you because I love Mark's teaching. I'm just going to say I grew up in Mark's, Mark Bowen's teaching and I appreciate his heart and his desire to be here, and, but I'm honored. I'm thankful. Kathy and I are blessed to be here with you and to serve the Bowen family, but also to serve you. This is the first time I've been able to be here and teach. And this church and the people in this church have a very special place in our heart. In our family, uh, our son Ben lived here for a few years, lived with Rob and Sue, and, and went to school here. And you guys did a wonderful job of taking care of him and watching out for him, and we so appreciate that. I want you to know. It's, it's great to be here today, and, and my prayer has been that I would bring a blessing to you. That's my desire. I can't do that on my own, but I'm asking God to do that. And uh, I, I just want to tell you, I, I feel like I'm a very blessed man, and it isn't because I deserve it. I, let's be clear on that. This is my family here. This was just taken uh, a couple weeks ago, Thanksgiving, right before Thanksgiving. And you can see uh, our son there uh, on the upper left with his wife, Ashley, uh, Kathy and I. Kathy's holding our newest grandbaby, little Rita. She's three months old. Uh, to her right is, uh, or to, our, to the right side of my wife, there is our daughter, Kristen, her husband, Chris. And they have the four kids, three boys, Frank, Graham, Jules, and then little Rita, Nathan is the one on the right. He's our youngest. He's holding little jewels. And then the big, tall redhead, that's John. He's, he's, uh, he's our middle son. I, I have an amazing family. I, I just want to tell you, I feel like God has just blessed me tremendously with my family. Not only my family, but my church family I'm from Hometown Church, and where Mark and Judy uh, have served and are, are going. And uh, we would cover your prayers this week as we prepare for little Henry's uh, celebration of life service toward the end of the week. If you could keep the Diley family and the Bowen family in your prayers, that would be tremendous. You know, we, we have a connection here that goes way back to Madison, where, where Kathy and I arrived on the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and, and we met Rob and Sue. Now, they were not married yet. And so we watched their, their love grow, and then, you know, eventually. So if you want to hear stories, you can come talk to me, okay? I'll... <laughs> I got some good stories of, this, of how God brought them together. It's pretty sweet. But, but what was so special about Rob and Sue is they, we were new Christians, brand new Christians, coming to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We didn't know what was going on. And they just, they just grabbed a hold of us and said, we, we, wanna, we want you to be with us, and we want, a, we want a disciple. We want to help you follow Jesus. They taught us how to read God's Word. They taught us how to pray. They taught us how to go share our faith on the campus, which was terrifying. And, and, and we learned and we grew, and I, I, I'm convinced I grew more as a Christian during that time, and I think largely because of Rob and Sue and a number of other people that were in the church at that time. So I, I stand before you a very thankful man, very blessed. And, and at the same time, I just I want you to understand that does not mean everything's going well in my life, in our lives. We have trials, we have challenges. You have trials and challenges, don't you? Life is difficult, it's heavy at times, and we go through seasons where God is blessing us, but, but we're not getting it. We're, in fact, we, sometimes we reject it because the packages by which God is delivering his blessings to us, we're not interested in those. They're painful, they're hard, they're frustrating, they're difficult to understand, they don't come in the timing that we would desire. And so we miss the blessing of God. And so this morning, I, I want to... I want to encourage you in something that I think is going to help. I'm going to share with you some things that I've been thinking about. God has been working into my life in greater and greater ways. And I, I pray it'll be a blessing for you, an encouragement for you, because I think God's drawing us all in this direction. Here's what, I, here's what I'm going to propose. If you're here this morning and you're, maybe you're struggling to see God's hand of blessing on your life, Maybe you're not feeling that way, and that's good. I'm glad you're here. But if you're here and you're like, I, you know what, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm feeling it, Mike, then, then I want to pray for us. 
But I want to tell you, um, I think the path to us receiving this blessing is going to come by us focusing and investing on receiving and responding to God's greatest blessing in our lives, Jesus Christ. Okay, And if we do that, we're going to put ourselves in a way better position to receive all of his blessings. I'm going, to, I'm going to trust that you're here because you want all of God's blessings in your life. And I think the starting point is for us to focus and invest in receiving and responding to the greatest blessing he's ever given, and that's his son, Jesus Christ. Relationship with God through Jesus. That's where we're going to go here this morning, okay? Uh, the, the title of the message is, Blessed to be a blessing, and it'll make sense as we go. I want to pray for us. I know Mark prayed for us here, but I want to pray for us again. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the blessing of your son. And I know we're going to be working our way toward uh, celebrating Christmas, but this morning, God, I ask, would you help us to tune in to your spirit, tune into your word? Would you communicate to our hearts in our minds, what you want us to know about this blessing that we have in Jesus and what to do with him. I, I ask you for help. I, I, pray, I need your help. We need your help here this morning. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start in Genesis. We're going to go back to Genesis and Genesis 12. This is the foundation for the teaching today. And we're just going to look at two verses and that's going to springboard us uh, to where we're going. And this is an interaction between God and Abram, soon to be Abraham, and this is, this is an amazing promise. Here's what God said. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's an amazing promise. Now, that was way back in Genesis, God talking to Abraham. What does that have to do with you and I, okay? Notice here, the blessing is that God would bless Abraham and that he would be a blessing. God would bring blessing to Abraham and then he would be a blessing. So let's fast forward. We're going to look at the tie to you and I. This blessing applies to you and I. And it's found in the book of Galatians, chapter 3. There's a section there. I'm just going to look at a couple verses here that, that draws a line from this promise to you and I. Let's read it. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, the real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles, that's you and I, right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago and he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Let me read that last part again. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. There's the link. As Christians, if you're a Christian here today, if you put your faith in Christ, if you've trusted in his death and resurrection to bring you into a right relationship with God, that's what this promise is talking about. It's to you. This promise comes to you and I. We are blessed as Abraham was blessed, and we're to be a blessing, as Abraham was a blessing. The same kind of faith that Abraham had, to put his faith in God, not in himself, is the same faith that saves you and I from what separates us from us and God, our sin. We have to place our faith not in what I can do, not what you can do for yourself, not overcoming your sin, but recognizing you have no chance of that. You have no chance to overcome your sin. And that's why God sent Jesus. And he died for you to to pay the penalty that you owe. And as we put our faith in that, it says that we're made right before God. We have right standing with God just as Abraham did. Now Abraham, we, we have an advantage over Abraham. Abraham had to look forward to the coming of Christ. And that's what this is referring to, that that looking forward to God's plan of salvation through his son. We get the privilege of reading it in the scriptures and looking back at the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's done, it's finished. He died, he rose again. And he's offering free gift, the free gift of salvation to those who would put their faith in him. So 
we go back to that promise. We're receiving God's blessing, and then we're going to give that blessing away. We're going to be blessed by God, and we're going to give it away. We used to sing this song. It's a psalm, Psalm 67, and I'm not going to sing it, okay? I'm not going there. But we used to open up our New American Standard version of the Bible, and we would, we would sing. Rob would play the guitar, and we would sing, and we sang this, this psalm, and I thought of this this week, Psalm 67. It says, God, be gracious. You can hum along if you'd like. No, don't do that. God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us so that all the ends of the earth may fear him. So God brings this blessing that his salvation would be known all over the world and that he would be revered. People would be in awe of him. And he wants to use you and I to see that accomplished. That's pretty exciting. Okay, I want to give you a picture, actually two pictures. And and hopefully, if you don't remember anything, else from this morning. I hope you remember this. Think river, not buckets. Think river, not buckets. Yes, Rob, there are trout in that river. I promise you. Okay. All right. So think river, not buckets. What do I mean by that? Okay. As Christians, if we're honest, and I'm just going to be honest with you here. Okay. I can tend to collect God's blessings, put put them in my little buckets, keep them all around me and protect those little buckets. Make sure that I keep comfortable. God, keep blessing me. Yep. Keep bringing that blessing. And I keep them in the buckets. And there they are, and I got them all. And once in a while, one will get kicked over, and, well, we got to fill that one back up. And we get comfortable, and we, and we settle into a nice, normal Christian life. I've done that. I do that. I have to resist that. Maybe you can, maybe you can relate to that. So let's not think buckets. Let's think river. That's what God's talking about here. There's a flowing in of the blessings of God. There's a flowing in of the blessings of God, and then it flows on through, and it flows out flows out to all who we get to be in contact with. That's, the, that's what I want you, that's the picture I want you to have as we go through the rest of our time here this morning. Okay, you got it? And Rob, yes, you can, you can fish that river. All right. The greatest blessing, remember I talked about at the beginning, if we focus in on the greatest blessing that God's ever given us, it's his son. It's his son, Jesus. And, and we're going to focus in on him here in just a, in just a bit. And, and what we're saying is the greatest blessing that God could ever give to us is relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what we're to proclaim to the nations. So if, if, if that's the greatest blessing that we've received, then, then we ought to give that away, right? We ought to, that's how that river flows. It comes in and it goes out. And we want to give that blessing away. We want to share the good news. We want to share our faith with the people that we love, the people around us, the people God has brought in contact with us. And you know, um, this is called evangelism. And I know that word. It's like, oh my gosh, evangelism. It makes me sweat. Okay, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Some of you in here, very few of you, you weird people, you have the gift of evangelism. And you're like, yeah, let's go. Let's go preach the gospel. I'm like, what? We would go on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. Rob would... Rob would make me do this. No, not really, but pretty much. We would go to like the unions, like Memorial Union. If you've ever been in Madison, you go to the Memorial Union, you know, oh, okay. There's, there's some people that have a lot of very interesting ideas. And you go there and you try to engage with them. And you try to share the good news. I think we ought to do that. I'm just saying, I think that's a good thing. And we did that. And it was hard and it was really hard because I don't have that gift, but you know what? God calls me to give away the good news. I remember when I became a Christian at age 17, I couldn't wait to tell my mom and dad. I couldn't wait to tell my brother and sister. I couldn't wait to tell my friends. And somehow over the years, I got my little buckets and I got comfortable. And now God has been putting on my heart more and more. Mike, you need to live a lifestyle of evangelism. A lifestyle of evangelism. Let me give you two words that I think help describe our role. They're from the New Testament. And they're words that we're familiar with. And the first one is witness. Second one is ambassador. So let's look at the first one, witness. Acts 1.8, this is where Jesus has died and rose again, and he's about to ascend to heaven. These are some of the last words that Jesus speaks to his disciples, and he says, but you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What this is saying is that God has entrusted us with his Holy Spirit, and he's going to use us to be a witness. What's a witness? Well, a witness is somebody who stands and testifies, right? They say, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, this is what I experienced, you testify, and we, who are we testifying? We're testifying to Jesus and what he, who he is and what he's done for us. The second word is ambassador, and this is found in 2 Corinthians 5. I love this passage. Let me read it here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So here's that word, ambassador. What's an ambassador? It's one who represents another. And we have been entrusted with this ministry and message of reconciliation. Of, of us being separated from God because of our sin, because he's holy and we're not. And, and Jesus Christ is the great reconciler. And, and we're pointing people to Christ, saying he's the only one who can reconcile you to a holy God. He loves you that much that he came and he died for you. He, he's going to remove the only barrier that stands between you and God, your sin. You know what's fascinating to me is God's chosen to use us in this role. I, I'm, I don't understand it, okay? I'm up here, I'm saying I don't understand. Why would God choose me to be part of this thing? I'm not very good at it, and uh, he'd probably do it way better than me, but he chose to put his Holy Spirit in us so that he could use us to be a blessing to others as we bring the gospel. So how do we do this? That's what we're going we're gonna to spend a little time here this morning, and I want to apologize in advance, because if I had the chance, I would do a series on this. But I want to I wanna give you um, something that's been um, transforming my life and my daily walk with Jesus in regard to living a lifestyle of evangelism, okay? And I'm on the beginning parts of this journey, but I'm excited about it because I, I see where God's taking me. And I want to I invite you along. I want to invite you to at least consider what we're going to talk about here this morning. So how do we do this? How do we share Christ with people that we know in a practical, effective, doable? And I'll say doable because it can be overwhelming, right? It can be overwhelming. Like, how do I even begin? What do I do? What do I say? What if this happens? What, right? I, I can... I can I can think of a lot of excuses. I used a lot. Rob could probably tell you how many excuses. I, yeah, you know, I got to wash my hair. I got to, you know, I can't, can't go out and share the gospel today, you know. But, but we, can, we can be effective at this. And you know what? Most Christians don't share their faith. I, I don't have the statistic in front of me, but I know it's, it's, it's sad. And I'm on that list. I, I, I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring for 20 years and, and, and I feel like God is beginning to stir my heart in some ways that where I, I'm going to be doing this as a lifestyle. So um, I didn't come up with this, okay? This came from two pastors in the Chicago area, Dave and John Ferguson from Community Christian Church. And what they did is they began looking at the Gospels, How did Jesus, Jesus was the greatest blesser of all time. How did he go about in his daily walk and bless people? How did he do it? And they studied that and they put together a a plan or a study that we've been going through over the last couple years as a church and we've been going through it as a small group and I've been diving into it too and it's been phenomenal. So the last couple years God's been just working this over in in our church and in my soul and uh, I want to share it with you. Here's, here's, um, here's the, the idea there. You know, sometimes it's good for us that when we teach and we study the Bible, we zoom in on a passage, and there's some things we can learn from that passage. Maybe it's one principle. But there's also a time for us to back away, and in particular, look at Jesus and his life. Because as a Christian, what are we, what are we invited to do? To follow his teachings? Absolutely, 100%. But we're to follow his lifestyle. His teachings and his lifestyle, well, they matched up. 
And so when we look at his teachings and we look at his lifestyle, we can understand what did he do? How did he live his day-to-day life? That's what we're going to look at. 1 John 2.6 says, Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. That's what a Christ follower is. Somebody who lives the life of Christ right now. So we're talking about a lifestyle, not a formula. So let me give it to you, and, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to walk through it uh, briefly. Uh, you'll, you'll understand when I say Okay, so here it is. It's bless. It's the word bless, and, and I'm going to walk through this. The first one is to begin. By, and this is, this is a, a strategy, if you will, not a formula, but a way of living where you can reach into your neighborhood, people that you know in your neighborhood, your workplace, your classmates, maybe people in your family, okay? So you're going to begin by praying. We're going to listen to them. We're going to eat with them. We're going to serve them. And we're going to share our story, which can be a bridge to the gospel, okay? That's where we're going to go here this morning. Now, this is pretty straightforward. This is not rocket science. I did not say this was easy. This is not easy stuff. It's going to take tremendous faith. It's going to take patience and perseverance. It's going to take you being in connection, close connection with Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit to love people well like this, okay? You cannot do this on your own. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to walk through each one of those briefly. And we're going to do two things. We're going to look at Jesus' example. How did Jesus model each of those things? And then what does it mean for us? What would it look like for us? I have a couple thoughts I'll share with you on each of those on maybe how you could get started. But I want to encourage you not to be overwhelmed. You don't have to do all these things at once. But I would encourage you to start with the first one, to start with prayer. And that's where we'll, that's where we'll go first. Okay, begin by praying. Let's look at Jesus' example. Uh, Luke 6, 12 through 13, Jesus prays all night. When he chooses his guys, here's what it says. One day, soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. So right at the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus is praying. He's talking to his father. Father, who is it? Who are the guys you want me to gather here and work with and invest in? Great place to start. Jesus did that. I love in Luke chapter 4, the story is where Jesus is in Simon Peter's house. And Simon Peter, Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And Jesus heals her. And then word spreads, right? And so everybody that's sick and needs healing and, and uh, demon-possessed, they all come over to Peter's house for, for a gathering. And Jesus, it says he healed all of them. He, ministry was hopping, okay? And then we read this in Luke 4. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. When they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that's why I was sent. Look, if I'm Jesus, I'm going, we're going to hunker down here for a while. We, you know, business is good. Ministry is good. People are coming. We're, you know, we're seeing God do amazing things. And, and he had a prayer time with his father, and we, we don't have... We don't have the information, but we know, most likely, the Father said, Jesus, we're going to keep moving. We're going to keep moving. It it doesn't make sense to me, but Jesus was in tune with the Father through prayer, and we see that throughout the Gospels. And the Father directed his steps as he went from place to place and did what he did. So that's that's Jesus' example. So what about for you and I? Here, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I'm, I'm going to try to be as practical as I can. I don't know what your, your time with God is like, but tomorrow morning when you wake up and you open the Bible, maybe you're going to read a psalm or proverb of the day, or maybe you're on a one-year Bible plan, or maybe you're doing the ad, Advent study. And you, you get out a journal. Get a journal. If you don't have a journal, get, get a journal. Get, get you know notebook. Just get a notebook and write the word bless on the top. Okay, this is how we're going to start. Write the word bless on the top. And then I want to encourage you to think of five to eight people. Don't go 50 people, okay? Start small. Just start with five. Maybe pick some neighbors around you or maybe your coworkers. Pick an area where you have some influence and you have relationships and, and write their names down and pray for them. And you don't have to get all elaborate or anything. Just begin by praying, God, I know you want to bless these people. Would you show me how to bless them? 
Give me an opportunity. Give me opportunities to bless Larry and Bob and Fred and Mary and the people that you write down. Okay, I, I, I've been praying for my neighbors. Kathy and I live in an area where we've gotten to know, we've been there uh, eight years, and, and, and we've gotten to know a bunch of the neighbors around us. And, and it's been amazing as I've just been doing this. If you don't do anything and you just do this, I think you're going to be amazed at what God does in response. You're going to have opportunities to bless Okay, and I've been praying for our neighbors, and God has been, and Kathy has been too, and, and God's been opening those doors. You know what I've noticed also as I've been praying for these people? God's changing my heart toward them. If you start praying for people by name and asking God to bless them, something happens inside of you. You begin to have God change your heart toward them. You get a bigger heart toward them, God's heart toward them, and that's that motivation that you're going to have to bless them because God loves them, and you can grow in your love for them too, and that can start with prayer. I was talking to my buddy Brian on Friday, and um, he said something very profound. He said, uh, bless without the B is just less. (laughs) That's really good, Brian. I'm going to use that. So if you don't like it, I'm sorry. (laughs) But if you don't pray, well, it's just going to be less, right? But we need God. We need God involved. If Jesus had the Father involved in this process, we ought to as well. We have access to him. All right, second one, listen. Listen to them. Now, Jesus is, he's perfect at all of these, by the way. He was an outstanding, he was a perfect listener. And his secret was questions. He would ask questions, and then he would just listen, right? That's his secret. There, uh, there's a book written by a guy, uh, Martin Copenhaver, called Jesus is the Question. And he, he says that Jesus asked 307 questions, and he only answered three. Now, I haven't verified this, but it sounds about right. Jesus was always asking questions and then listening, wasn't he? And, and I appreciate that. And I think you and I can get good at that. We'll talk about that. Luke chapter 18 is a story of the blind beggar. He's on the side of the road, and, he's, he, and he knows Jesus is walking by. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus. And they tell him to shut up, and he just yells louder, right? And Jesus says, bring the guy over. Bring him on over. And he looks at the guy, and he says this question. He asks this question. What do you want me to do for you? Like, Really, Jesus? I mean, come on, man. You, you, what's up with that? Have you ever know, Do you guys notice this stuff in the Bible? I notice this stuff in the Bible. Like, why would Jesus ask him? I mean, the dude is blind. He's begging. But I, I, I've thought about this, and I, I actually looked, uh, looked at a few studies, and there's, there's a few thoughts that intrigued me. One was this. Jesus didn't want to assume that he knew what this guy was going to ask for. I don't know if that's right or not, but he asked it, and then he listened. And of course, the guy said, I want to see. And Jesus gave him his sight back. But I appreciate that. I appreciate that insight. Again, I don't know if it's exactly right, but it, it, it's, it's striking to me that he would ask that question of a man who's standing in front of him who's blind. So how about for us? Well, this is what Fred Rogers said. Love begins with listening. I was going to put Mr. Rogers, but then you guys would have con- confused that with Aaron, but I, I know Aaron probably, Aaron probably wouldn't have said that. I don't know if he would have said that. Okay, so Fred Rogers, you guys know Mr. Rogers. Here's your assignment, by the way. If you, if you don't do any action steps, <laughs> watch A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Anybody seen that movie? It was, came out a while ago. Watch it again. This guy is incredible at listening. Mr. Rogers knew how to value the person in front of him. That person in front of him was the most important person in the world. Why? Because he knew that person was valuable to God. He knew it. He knew that person was valuable to God, and he he wanted to give the attention to that man. And so he was listening. He would take it in. And that's what you and I need to do. Listen, we, we know in our culture people are not good at listening. Social media isn't helping. It's all about getting your ideas out, right? Nobody's listening these days. And if you started to listen to people, oh my goodness. You talk about them feeling loved. They will feel loved. And and Mr. Rogers knew that. Jesus knew that. And we can practice this, and we're going to have to practice this. Do you know the opposite of 
of uh, listening is not speaking. The opposite of listening is waiting to speak. And I do that all the time. I'm not listening to the person. I just want to get my word in. I want to respond to what they said. I'm not even listening. So we've got some work to do. We have to practice listening, and God can help us do that. This is a skill that God can help us learn and grow in, and it'll come from us valuing that person that's in front of us, that person that we've been praying for, and it'll come from the fact that they have a story. Every person has a story. Every person has a story, and if we, if we ask questions and we listen, we're going to learn. We're going to learn about their story, and we're going to value them, and they're going to feel valued. James 1.19 says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. So here's, here's a, um, and by the way, I'll shoot my notes over to uh, Justin. If you guys want a copy of my notes, you can have my notes if, the, if it's going too fast here. But look at these four H's. I like this as kind of a, a guideline for putting some questions together. You want to have some questions in your back pocket, okay? So there's four things there, history. Hey, where'd you grow up? How did you... My neighbor, Eddie, Eddie, how'd you meet Linda? You know, those kinds of questions. And then listen, uh, heart, what's your favorite restaurant? What's your favorite sports team? Those kinds of things. Habits, what do you like to do for fun? What do you do in your free time? And then hurts, how are you doing with? And then name the situation. The other day, uh, I had uh, caught word that Eddie's brother, my, my neighbor, Eddie, uh, is in his mid-70s, just had hip replacement surgery. His brother passed away. From, and he was living in another state. So I went over there to hang out with Eddie and just, and just be with him. Eddie, how are you doing? And, and he told me a little bit about it. I said, tell me about your brother Bob. And for about 20, 25 minutes, he just told story after story of their relationship. They had a very close relationship. And it gave me an opportunity to just be there with him and feel his pain and grieve with him and listen to him. And God will give us opportunities but we got to be ready. So be ready with some questions, okay? All right, number three, eat together. I like this one. Eat together. Look, food was a huge part of Jesus' ministry, right? It, it was in his parables. It was all over his miracles. And he was, eating, he was eating with everybody. Jesus ate all kinds of foods around all kinds of tables in all kinds of places with all kinds of people, right? He was everywhere we look. He's eating with somebody, and, and he often got in trouble for who he ate with. Isn't that interesting? In Mark 2, it says this, But when the teachers of, the, of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with such scum? Jesus was often criticized for who he ate with. Why? What's going on there? Well, um, Scott Barchi, who's a New Testament scholar, said this, about food and eating together. Mealtimes were far more than occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcomed at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Isn't that interesting? That's the culture there, and I think we have a bit of that culture here. I don't know if it's as intense, but, but when you have a meal with somebody, that, there's something special there. Jesus understood this. One of my favorite stories is Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the little tax collector guy, okay? I was, he's probably as tall as me, you know? And, and he was not a good guy. He was a Jewish man that had betrayed his people, gone over to work for the Roman government and collected taxes from the Jews and collected extra, and this man was super rich. So in other words, he stole money from his own people. So he's a lonely guy. And um, he hears that Jesus is coming through Jericho, so he climbs up a tree because he just wants to get a look at Jesus. And you could read all about this in Luke 19. But he, he, he's, he wants to at least see Jesus. And look, I don't know how Jesus knew this guy's name. He didn't have a name tag, I don't think. All right? Now, maybe he was notorious enough in that area where Jesus had heard about him. But I'm guessing Jesus was praying earlier that morning and the father said, I want you to go through Jericho and you're going to see this dude up on the tree and I want you to go over to his house. And so Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to eat at your, I'm going to go to your house today. Now, it doesn't say he ate with him, but I'm going to, I'm going to make an assumption here based on the culture that if a person was invited into your home, you had some food. Okay, so they shared a meal together. That's my best assumption. I could be wrong, but I think that's pretty, pretty accurate. Think about it. This guy's whole life was turned upside down in one meal 
and conversation with Jesus. That's pretty incredible. I'm looking forward to meeting Zacchaeus because I want to know what did they talk about. We don't know what they talked about when Jesus went over there. But this man's whole life was turned upside down and he became a follower of Jesus that day. All right, so what does this look like for you and I? And I just want to be as honest as I can with you. you we have to be intentional about this. It's not going to happen. It's not going to spontaneously happen, probably. At least for us, our schedules are busy. You have busy schedules. How are you going to make room for having somebody over to your house? You got to get the house clean. You got Romans chapter 12, 13, Paul says, always be eager to practice hospitality. So we ought to be ready for it. We're going to have to plan for it or it's not going to happen. And I want to encourage you to think in that, with that mindset. So our small group, we meet on Tuesday nights. And we decided that we would meet the first three Tuesdays and we would leave the fourth Tuesday open so that people could come over. Now, we've invited people from our small group over, but that spot is open for us to, to invite somebody into our home. And I, I look forward to how God's going to use that going forward. But you've got to create some space for this to happen. Okay? Here's what Leonard Sweet, the author, said. As we sit and eat together, we don't just pass food around. Fellow diners pass bits of themselves back and forth as well. And, you know, as you, uh, as you eat together, you're going to hear some of their story. If you, if you have questions ready, you're going to listen and you're going to hear their story. You're going, to see, you're going to hear about what's going on inside of them, what's going on in their lives. Food's a great way to do that. All right, first S, serve them. Jesus was the greatest servant of all, was he not? Mark 10, 45, Jesus said this about himself, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served people all the time. He served to the point of going to the cross. John chapter 13 is uh, perhaps the, the pinnacle prior to the cross of his serving it's a story where he washes the disgusting, gross feet of his disciples. And I love this section. I love this, this passage. And every time I read it, here's what I think. I think he washed Peter's feet and he washed Judas's feet. And he washed Judas's feet just as passionately as he washed Peter's feet and John's feet and James' feet. And he knew that in a few short hours, Judas would betray him. And he served. He laid his life down. And this is what he said in uh, verses 15 and 17. I have given you an example to follow after washing their feet. Do as I have done to you. Wash people's feet. Serve them. And then he says in verse 17, Now that you know these things, God will bless you if you do them. So Jesus brings a blessing he says, go bless people, serve them, and then God will bless you. So you're blessed by God, so you go bless others, and guess what happens? You get blessed. That's what Jesus is saying here. And he's talking about service. So for us, what, what, what should we do? Well, as you pray for people in your group, as you listen to them, as you eat with them, you're going to find out they have needs. And I want to encourage you to start jumping in and meeting those needs. Start small. Maybe you help them shovel snow or bring in their garbage cans or drive them to the airport or watch their dog when they go away for a few hours. Whatever it is, listen and watch for opportunities to serve in simple ways. And if you're not getting any traction, here's an idea. Consider inviting them to come help you. I'm serious about that. Maybe you need help moving something. And they could provide a little muscle. Or, or you just need a tool that they have. Or, or maybe you want their advice on a project that you're working on. Whatever it is, consider inviting them to come help you first. That might open the door to them asking you for help. Okay. Uh, we do this thing called Mission to Our City every summer. And, um, and it's a five-day mission trip with our whole church. And it's awesome, and I love it. And, and one of the components of the mission trip is that we go and we do service projects for people. And I always sign up our neighbors. We have two widows in our neighborhood. One's a believer, one's not a believer. We have a young family across the street. Pete and Nikki, they just moved in a little while ago. They just had a baby last year, and, and we, we got on it. We're like, we're going to come. He, Pete started working night shift. So they're having a hard time. They have a nice 
they have woods and stuff and, and a yard space that they want to get cleared. I'm like, Pete, why don't you let us bring some people over? We had about 15, 16 people come over and for about three hours on, I think it was the hottest day of the summer. I'm not kidding you. It was unbelievable. And we worked our hinders off, okay? And we served this family with all these people. We, had, we wear these shirts that say the church has left the building and, and, and we served them. And, and my neighbor, Eddie, next door, he goes, what's up with the blue shirts? <laughs> and said, here's what we're doing, Eddie. And we actually did a service project for Eddie. But I always want to be on that list because if you can get, some, if you can get your group together, a group of people together, that's awesome. They can, they can help you serve. All right, last one. You guys are doing great. Okay, we're in the home stretch here. Share your God story. This is so important. This is so important. Now, what I want to say about Jesus is he, he was God's story. He was the centerpiece of God's story. His life was the story. But, but I love Nicodemus. I love John chapter 3, Jesus' interaction with a religious leader who thought Jesus was a, a, a good guy. In fact, he comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want anybody to know that he's visiting him. And he says, Jesus, we know you're from God because you're doing all this cool stuff. And Jesus just shut him off at that point and just laid it out for him. And that's where we find the verse, John 3.16. Jesus quotes, or he gives him John 3.16. He gives him God's story. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I, I can imagine Nicodemus fell down after that because it was disorienting for him. He was standing in front of God himself in the flesh. And I think he began to see it. So Jesus was good at this. In Mark 5, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. And it says, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So Jesus is saying, go tell the story. Go tell what I've done. Tell them about me. Tell them what he's done. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to tell people about what God has done. He wants us to share our testimony, to testify our story. And it's going to take some time for you to do this. My guess is, is there aren't too many people in here because it's, I, I've, not, I've asked a lot of people this. Not many people have kind of their story ready to share. If you do, that's fantastic. It should be short. It should be three to five minutes. Summary of three things. What was your life like before Jesus got a hold of you? How did Jesus get a hold of your life? And then what has your life been like since? Take some time and write out some thoughts about each of those and develop a three to five minute story and practice it so that you're ready to share it. We, uh, we, I take mission teams to Italy. And uh, actually Rob and Justin and Sam came with me a few years ago. And, and every team that comes with me, we do this. We prepare our story because we're working with college students and we'll, we'll, we will have an opportunity to tell them about Jesus through our story. It'll happen. It's going to happen sometime during that week, many times. And so I want them to be ready. And God has been faithful to use those stories in the lives of these college students to help God become real for them. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And here's, here's my last point. Your story can be a very powerful bridge to the gospel, to the good news of Jesus. And I'm just going to say it straight. I want to encourage you to find a way to go through the scriptures with somebody in a simple way and share the gospel with them. It's great to share your testimony. I, I think that's a, it can be a powerful bridge to the gospel, but, but it's God's word that is the power, the gospel of God's word, his grace that is, is going to save people. And so at Hometown, we, we have these bracelets. They're colored bracelets, and there's, there's five verses on here, and passages on here, Romans, mostly Romans, and then Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And then there's this tab Bible. You don't have to use this tool. You can use a, a gospel tract. But, but we love this because you can then give this to the person after you go, hey, these, let me give you this bracelet. Uh, these five verses changed my whole life. Can I tell you about it? Can we go through these? Yeah, we can go through those. Okay, and you start with tab number one and you just have them read it and you talk about what does the verse say? Romans 3.23, for all is sin and falls short of the glory of God. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And my favorite is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because we cannot get there on our good works. It has to be by faith, the faith of, of, of like Abraham. And it's God's grace that saves us, not our works. And you just walk through the scriptures with them. This tool is, this is awesome. It's not the only tool. But I want to encourage you to, to be trained in this, work on this, and be ready to bring the scriptures to bear when the time is right. There's no sequence to this. This can all happen in, in one conversation. You could be at a coffee shop and this could all happen. So don't, don't get hung up on the order. Just begin. And I just want to encourage you, God has lavished his blessing on you in Jesus Christ. He sent his son to die for you. He loves you. He proved that. Let's be a river, not buckets. Let's be a river. Let's let God's love and blessing flow into our lives and out of our lives. And I just want to encourage you, begin with prayer. Let's pray as we close. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for... Uh, the opportunity to be here to tell you that we love you and we're so thankful for your blessings in our lives. We're most thankful for Jesus, the fact that you sent him to this earth. And Jesus, we're thankful to you for your willingness to climb upon that cross, to stretch your arms out and be crucified, to shed your blood so that we could be in relationship with you for all of eternity. Thank you for that. God, we can never pay you back, but we want to pass that blessing on. Would you help us? Would you help us identify people and and, and engage in this strategy, Jesus, that you lived out? We want this to be our lifestyle. Would you help us with that? And we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. Thanks for your attention. May God bless you. Hang out with us. Love to get to know you. Love to talk with you if you have any